Hi there and welcome to the channel and in this video I'll share my latest book haul which is rather large so the best thing to do is just get on with it. We begin with three children's novels the first of which is this Patrick Ness A Monster Calls. There's also a movie adaptation a still from which adorns the cover. I read the first chapter or two and found myself absolutely hooked. In fact in terms of gripping the reader's imagination this is pretty much a perfect work of art. It centers on a young boy, Connor, living in the English countryside, whose mum is very sick. And one night, Connor awakens from a nightmare, opens his bedroom window, and there is a monstrous yew tree that can speak. Yes, and from there, the adventure begins. Highly recommended. Next, we have Rebecca's Dead, When You Reach Me, a Newbury Award nominee. I always buy any children's books with these stickers on them because you're pretty much guaranteed a great read and it was unintended but these two books really work well together in this one connor leads a very isolated rural existence this one is set in the hurly burly of new york city and through the eyes of its narrator miranda a young girl we're introduced to a large and diverse cast of characters and she zeroes in on all of their quirks and eccentricities. There's a time travel motif in here. It's ingeniously put together. And yes, I'd also highly recommend this one too. Lastly, another Newbury Award nominee, Getting Near to Baby. And as the cover shows, we have two girls perched on the roof of a house. And basically, this is where they spend most of the novel. And the reasons for them being up there are explained through a series of flashbacks. It's not as good as these two, but perhaps in the second half it will get better. I may as well hold out hope. Okay, next up we have a series of dystopian fictions. So first up we have this, Margaret Atwood, Oryx and Craig. This is the first Margaret Atwood book I've ever read and I've never watched any of the movie adaptations or TV series based on her work. I came to this completely blind and the reason I'm reading it, it was assigned for a course I'm taking this semester on Utopia and some 200 pages in. I have to say, in terms of entertainment, this is excellent and I can see why many people enjoy her work, but as art, in my view, it's sadly deficient. I'll give two reasons for this. Firstly, the cadences of the sentences, many of which end on a strong beat. I found that really off-putting after a while. And then there's this poetic layer that Atwood incorporates. She hangs it upon the central character, Snowman, having attended, as I did, art school. But I felt it was just her way of incorporating this poetic material into her text. And yes, I found it rather gruesome. Let me just give you an example. Okay, here we go. This is an apostrophe on the part of Snowman. Oh, stolen secret picnics. Oh, sweet delight. Oh, clear memory. Oh, pure pain. Oh, endless night. There's really no need for this kind of stuff to be just jammed into what is otherwise a pretty good dystopian sci-fi novel. If anyone watching this has read and enjoyed Oryx and Craig and you haven't read and enjoyed Ridley Walker by Russell Hoban, I would point you in the direction of my review of this. This is far superior, in my view, to Atwood's book. Link in the description below. Okay, next. I discovered this next book completely by chance and I was drawn to it by the cover art. It's Victor Pelevin's Amon Ra, not Omon Ra, as it looks to be. I'm assured that is the correct pronunciation. It's a postmodern fiction. And what it does is pick apart the ideology of the Soviet Union. And it centers on a young boy and how his dream of becoming an astronaut both does and doesn't reach fruition. It's such a good read and will be the subject of my next review. Okay, next. Anthony Burgess's a Clockwork Orange in this wonderful Norton Critical Edition. I also have a Penguin Classics edition of this too, and I've read it numerous times 
over the years. Anthony Burgess is without doubt one of my favourite writers and the movie adaptation of A Clockwork Orange is one of my favourite films and that's because all of the authority figures are such deviants, they're so disgusting, they're such perverts that it really plays to my own deeply anti-authoritarian instincts. Okay, next we have Sir Thomas More's Utopia, from which the term utopia derives. However, this is not, strictly speaking, the first utopia. You can trace them all the way back to Plato's Republic. This is also in a beautiful Norton Critical Edition. Okay, let's move on now to something completely different. So next we have two examples of French literature. Firstly, Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary in the original, and what I basically do is read this alongside an English translation. Anyone familiar with Jacques Rancière's The Ignorant Schoolmaster will understand this approach. It does help me to enjoy the original being supported by the translation when necessary. If I can just appreciate a single chapter of this work, that at this point in my French learning will be sufficient reward. Okay, next we have this mad love. I was astonished to find this staring back at me from the bookshelf of one of the used bookstores here in Taipei City. No, it can't be, can it? But yes, when I opened it, it was indeed the Surrealist classic by André Breton, the founder of Surrealism. It has lots of nice pictures inside, as you'd expect. I'm really looking forward to reading that. Next up, Shakespeare and two editions of the same play, As You Like It. First, the Arden Shakespeare. Now, over the years, I've favoured the Arden Shakespeare. I have a whole stack of them behind me, but the Oxford World's Classics edition of this play is making me rethink the wisdom of that decision, and I may transfer my allegiance to the Oxford editions. The introduction in this one is just so wonderful. It traces the various productions there have been of this play over the centuries with illustrations and photographs from more contemporary productions. The afterlife, as it were, of As You Like It, and it helps you understand the place it still occupies in contemporary culture. By contrast, the Arden Shakespeare introduction is just so fusty and focuses almost exclusively on minute textual differences between the various printings of the play in the folios. So, sorry Arden Shakespeare, from now on I'm going to be looking for these. Okay, next. Three examples of life writing here, the first of which is this, Lucy Duff Gordon by Catherine Frank. I have to confess, I knew nothing at all about Lucy Duff Gordon when I picked this up, but a little research reveals that she was a Victorian intellectual. As a child, she was a playmate of John Stuart Mill, and her literary reputation rests upon a series of letters she wrote about Egypt during her time there. So I'm looking forward to learning more about her. Then a classic of life writing. It's Helen Keller's The Story of My Life. As a child, I was exposed oh so many times to the black and white movie about Helen Keller. My mum was an ardent admirer of this woman, and rightly so. In my later years, how long ago would it be? Perhaps 20 years or so back, I found myself living in the Muscle Shoals area of Alabama and used to drive almost every day past the house where Helen Keller was born and grew up. That used to move me every single time. I can't wait to finally read this book. And then one more autobiography. It's Among the White Moon Faces by Shirley Gok Lin Nim, a Malaysian woman who relocated to America. And what attracted me to this was it's published by the Feminist Press. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to find some real intellectual sustenance from that. Okay, next. A few reference works to show you and then we'll move on to a stack of novels. The first of them is this magnificent Dictionary of English Folklore in hardback. Hasn't been read. It's basically new. Purchased for pennies. You can see the delight on my face. And then, equally good, but twice the weight, the Oxford Companion to the English Language. Great to have on the desk. And 
finally, the Penguin Short History of English Literature. I've got the Oxford Short History of English Literature too. These are just useful to read through and just keep placing in one's mind that timeline of the development of English literature. Nice picture on the front there. Okay, let's move on to a whole bunch of novels. First we have this, Chu Tianwen, a Taiwanese writer with his notes of a desolate man. And this ticks two of the boxes with regards to my research interests being both an illness narrative, it's about AIDS, and also an example of Southeast Asian writing. Then Alice Walker, The Colour Purple. I do already have this, but this edition is better. I've only seen the movie adaptation. I will get round to reading this one day. Next, a Nobel winner, Patrick Modiano, the French writer, Via Triste. I've read this, didn't take long, and I have to say, it was incredibly disappointing. Absolutely nothing happens. I can't really understand why someone would write this or why someone would read this. If you know, let me know in the comments. Then, two novels by Sir Walter Scott, one of my favourite writers. First, we have this, The Black Dwarf one of those expensive critical editions. It's barely 200 pages long, so it can serve as a great introduction to the pleasures of Sir Walter Scott. I really enjoyed it. It's gothic, but in the manner of Anne Radcliffe's Mysteries of Adolfo and Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey. That is, all of the superstitions of the locals about the goings-on turn out to be just that. Superstitions, there's a rational basis for these seemingly magical, miraculous occurrences. It's a very satisfying story, highly recommended. And then Tales of Old Mortality, the next novel he published after The Black Dwarf. I haven't started this yet. Perhaps I'll get round to it in October. Then Tobias Smollett's Humphrey Clinker. I've tried to read this novel a number of times. It's an epistolary novel. And it centers on farcical goings on in Bath. Hopefully this time I'll manage to finish it. Then Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. The principal attraction here for me is that Fenimore Cooper was a great admirer of Scott. And he basically produced historical romances in the manner of Scott set on the North American continent. I did read an abridged version of this once for the class of junior high school students wasn't very good. Hopefully the unabridged version will be far superior. Staying in America for these last two books, hardbacks also purchased for pennies, Mark Twain, Roughing It, and then in the same series we have Mark Twain's Life on the Mississippi. I've dipped into this, if you'll excuse the pun, over the years. And I did, of course, used to live in Memphis, right on the banks of the Mississippi. I really should get around enjoying the whole of this work. Okay, let's move on. Next we have poetry and it's this Selected Poems of Pablo Neruda, Full Woman, Fleshly Apple, Hot Moon. It's a parallel translation which is great for me and when I opened it for the first time what did I see but a poem about the most amazing creature that I've ever seen during all my time on earth. I'm speaking of course about the hummingbird let me just read you the first verse of this wonderful poem. I'll read it in English. To the flower sipper, flying spark of water, incandescent drop of American fire, brilliant epitome of the jungle, rainbow of celestial precision. To the hummingbird, an arc, a golden thread, a blaze of green. Just wonderful poetry there. The same cannot be said, unfortunately, for the next book. Jeanette Winterson's Weight, which is a retelling of the myth of Sisyphus, and it tries very hard to be poetic, and it sets itself the task. And I don't know why quite so many artists do this, of trying to make the picture of reality that contemporary physics presents us with into something we should marvel at. I see nothing to marvel at in electrons or photons. So we have on the first page this image radioactive whispers for this microwave background radiation, I suppose. And I just knew I can't get into this stuff. I don't find anything wonderful 
about this future, the world according to Brian Cox, we might call it. So moving swiftly on, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. And this one is written and illustrated by Howard Pyle. This was my first passion. As a reader growing up, I was raised not far from Sherwood Forest. I used to believe that Little John, Friar Tuck, Will Scarlet, Robin Hood were all still alive and out there living. So vivid were they. In my imagination, I did dream about going and living in a tree. <sighs> Rather ashamed to say that. Then we have James Joyce, The Dubliners. I've read two or three of these in the past. It's a Signet classic, so I'll need the glasses, but we'll see if I can finish it off. Then Thomas Bernhard's Goethe dies. Yes, I returned to my Thomas Bernhard series this month and produced the third installment, and it was focused on Goethe dies. This is a problematic translation into English, but still the title story is absolutely wonderful. I'll link to that video in the description below for any of you who have yet to view it. All right, one more. It's also German in origin. It's E.T.A. Hoffman's Tales. I don't know much about what I'm going to find in here, but he's regarded as a classic author, so we'll see. Okay, what do we have in the remaining pile? We're nearing the end, I promise, and as we do so, the tone becomes steadily more scholarly. So we begin with Jesse L. Weston from Ritual to Romance. This is a study of the Grail myth, and it's considered highly informative for understanding more fully T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, then Shamanism, one of my passions, Maya Cosmos, and this looks on its face like a genuine work of scholarship with all of these technical illustrations. However, it's nothing really of the kind, so the text I won't bother with, but the pictures and the illustrations took me right back to my time living in Guatemala and Mexico. Next, the Making of Modern Japan by Marius B. Jansen. This, I hope, will provide valuable background for my growing interest in Japanese literature. Then again, my research interests. Illness narratives. This is Melancholia and Moralism. These are all essays on HIV and AIDS. Next, Concentric. This is an issue of the journal published by National Taiwan University, where I am a doctoral student. This one focuses on narrative code switching, the most famous example of which is in Thomas Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles. Next, we have Women and Disability in Medieval Literature. This has a great chapter on Marie de France, about whose lay I made one of my favourite videos, a link in the description. Yes, it focuses on Miss Clavret, her werewolf lay, and this essay is really enjoyable. Next, Literary Theory, Time and Narrative by Paul Ricoeur. Really, very, very deep, a very smart person indeed. I'm slowly going to work my way through this. More Disability Studies themed material. It's this, Sensational Deviance, Disability in 19th Century Sensation Fictions. I really love sensation novels, Wilkie Collins, Mary Elizabeth Braddon, and I actually made a video about her Lady Audley's Secret not long ago. I'll also link to that in the description. Why not? Then another disabilities related book, Dementia and Literature. This had a good chapter actually that pointed me towards an interesting book, Elizabeth is Missing, which is told in the first person by an elderly woman who is suffering from dementia. I got hold of a copy and I'm going to give that a read. And to finish, modernism and the materiality of texts. And there we have it. We are done. Thank you for watching this far. All that remains is for me to bid you farewell in the customary fashion. So until the next time, be safe, be strong. Nanu nanu.